They were the baddest band on the planet. Welcome to the jungle. We got fun and games. We just didn't really give a shit about anything else going on around us. There was no holds barred. I hear you scream. They looked like outlaws. The music was like nothing I had ever heard. Profane and powerful, Guns N' Roses rescued rock and roll with a unique sound built by Life on the Edge. It was a 24-hour day party. Tupperware is full of cocaine. I'd hear, when I look over and Duff would be laid out on the stage, passed out. Led by mesmerizing frontman Axl Rose, Guns N' Roses could inspire religious devotion. A riot, or both. I went out to the stage, and you know they're shredding the place. The whole place just collectively destroyed everything. It was it was insane. Where do we go now? And from day one, the gun's greatest danger was to themselves. I did everything I possibly could to try and kill myself. I got a phone call saying Slash is dead. I mean, d dead, blue dead. He had no pulse. They live and they die. Fueled by nonstop drug abuse and outrageous egos, it took just a few years for the group to turn their guns on each other. That's the sound of the band breaking up right there. A band is a marriage, and they were bound for divorce court. Guns N' Roses, the story behind the music. Come on, buddy. It's August 2002. In seven years after the implosion of the world's most dangerous band, the reclusive Axl Rose finally emerges with Guns N' Roses at the MTV Video Music Awards. The band's name was familiar, but the faces were not. A lot of people think it's almost sacrilege, <laughs> you know, to do it that way, but he doesn't give a hot Axel's hired guns bore no resemblance to the rock and roll outlaws that had enraged parents and enraptured fans in the 1980s. Their menacing sound fueled by lies of extreme decadence and danger. Me and Duff were drinking at least a half gallon of vodka or Jack Daniels a day, just trying to sort of keep ourselves, you know, like on, on an even keel. They lived it. And that's why, you know, they were one notch above everybody else. They were the real deal. But guns would ultimately choke on their own excess. Less than a decade after shocking the rock world with their seminal debut, Appetite for Destruction, drugs, booze, and runaway egos tore the band apart. Everything was falling apart. Everything was wrong that was going on there. I mean, it was trouble after trouble after trouble, you know? It didn't stop. You didn't know from one minute if it was going to end because of a drug overdose, because of a riot, because of it just imploding. But at the same time, you didn't know if that same day you were going to see the greatest musical performance of all time. Guns N' Roses' rebellious roots were planted on the grimy streets of Hollywood in 1982. Two local misfits named Steven Adler and Saul Hudson, a.k.a. Slash, began amping up their hard rock dreams. 
Steven started playing drums and I started playing guitar and uh, we started a band. And that's where Gun starts for me. In late 84, the struggling musicians checked out a band called Hollywood Rose at an L.A. gig. The group was fronted by Jeffrey Isabel and Bill Bailey, Indiana transplants who'd renamed themselves Izzy Stradlin and W. Axel Rose. To Slash and Steven, Axel's hypnotic performance was nothing short of magic. After the show, I introduced Axel to Slash and who knew that that was like history in the making, but that was the first time Slash met Axel. I said to Slash, if we get that singer and that guitar player, we'll have a kick-ass band. By March of 85, Steven and Slash had joined forces with Axl Rose and Izzy Stradlin. That same month, bassist Michael Duff McKagan cemented the lineup. They called themselves Guns N' Roses. Through so many different people, and this ended up being the people that we most believed in. We're like a family, we believe in each other. We were a gang, that's how we thought of ourselves. We play rock and roll music to kick your ass. Guns were finally cocked and loaded, and their combustible on stage chemistry quickly offered a dangerous alternative to make up metal groups like Cinderella and Poison. All these other bands, you know, they had all these band acts and makeup and crap. And we did. We just went out there and played rock and roll. They looked like outlaws. That was number one. And the music was, to me, like nothing I had ever heard. We just didn't really give a shit about anything else going on around us. We just had this edge, this sort of unpredictable scary thing about what it was that we did and that there was no holds barred. And from the beginning, Gunn's hunger for success was matched only by their appetite for excess. Quite often, it was a 24-hour day party. Tupperwares full of cocaine. Literally Tupperwares. Um, everybody was completely strung out and using ecstasy. Nobody drank as much as Slash and nobody passed out as much as Slash. We were just following in the footsteps of all the guys that we grew up, you know, were our heroes growing up. And then we just took it that one step further. Virtually homeless and constantly migrating from one squalid crash pad to another, guns were single-minded in their pursuit of just two things, partying and rock and roll. These guys were living off of biscuits and gravy, from Denny's, you know, from friends. There was usually at least a few bodies on the floor that you had to step over when you walked in. There was always a song written on a pizza box and empty liquor bottles everywhere. We were always scrounging to find a place to practice or find a place to crash. And back in those days, the best people to know were strippers because they are the ones that were empathetic, you know, <laughs> to your needs. Once on stage, the band 